Okay. <laughs> so you've all agreed to listen to me talk about worms. That's great. <laughs> Yeah, so I can just dive in because I've, I've done my pitch. Um, so nematodes are incredibly important. They're some of the most abundant organisms on our planet, and they live in nearly every imaginable habitat. And that includes inside other organisms. And so um, a good example of this is um, these Meloidogyne species, which cause huge economic losses each year by parasitizing our crop plants. But nematodes also parasitize other animals, and that includes humans. An example being Onchocerca volvulus, which is the causative agent of river blindness. And it's estimated that over one and a half billion people worldwide are actively infected with nematodes. And so there's therefore a huge interest in understanding how nematode parasitism works, and importantly, how it evolves. And so what people do is they take their parasite of interest, they study some aspects of its biology, and they compare it to the nematode that we know most about, Sooner of Ditus elegans. Um, but the issue there is that C. elegans is only distant related to the vast majority of species. And so ideally what we need is a species that's very closely related to C. elegans, but one that's a parasite. However, despite the fact we've discovered over 50 new species in the genus Cynorhabditis in the last 10 years, all of those in laboratory culture are free living, and the vast majority have been isolated from places like rotting fruit and vegetable matter. However, C. bovis does things slightly differently. So C. bovis has been isolated several times from the ears of zebu cattle in eastern Africa. And there it's associated with this disease called bovine parasitic otitis, which causes sort of inflammation for the cow, discharge, the ear can droop down, and in rare cases lead to mortality. And as is the case for most Cynorhabditis species, we believe that C. bovis gets from ear to ear um, with the help of an invertebrate transport host. In this case, the old world screwworm fly is a good candidate because the larvae of these flies are also found in the ear. And so C. bovis is a really unusual species, really closely related to C. elegans, but we know very little about it. There's just a handful of papers from the 80s and 90s describing it in these cows. And I wanted to change that and my slide. And so I got in contact with Professor Eric Fev at the International Livestock Research Institute in Kenya. And I told him the story of C. bovis, and he very enthusiastically responded that he had an existing surveillance program where he had a team of vets and scientists going out and taking samples from livestock at livestock markets and slaughterhouses. And that he had a small laboratory um, in the border town of Basia that I could use. And so a plan was forming to, to find the worm, but then the question was, well, how do we sequence it? I quickly realized that getting the appropriate permits to get these worms out of Kenya and into the UK was going to be incredibly difficult. The UK don't want bovine samples, for example, for things like foot and mouth disease. And so it was going to take longer than I had left in my PhD. So then I thought, why don't I just export high molecular weight DNA? But that's not only expensive, but you also still need a whole suite of permits. And then I thought, well, why don't we just sequence in Kenya? And I knew that another PhD student from the University of Edinburgh was actually sequencing in this lab using the Minion device. And so the plan was, go to Kenya. Oh, another thing, I found out that they had an Illumina MySync machine down in Nairobi that I could use to generate that Illumina data that I'd need for the reference genome. And so the plan was, go to Kenya, find the worm, sequence its genome. And I had four weeks. And so we started, we woke up every day, and the vets would, of course, do the hard work of actually sticking their fingers in the cow's ears and washing with a, with a small cotton wool sample soaked in physiological saline. And then I'd go to the lab each day and look at these samples and sort of look for anything that resembled a worm. And three weeks passed, and we'd sampled over 40 animals, and we hadn't found a single thing. And just as I was losing hope, out crawls a little worm from one of these samples. And indeed, I was able to isolate about 50 nematode larvae from this sample. Um, but the, the, you need far more than 50 worms to generate a genome. You need far more than 50 worms to run the minion. And so what I did was to take these worms and place them onto e, uh, e. coli seeded agar plates, which is how we usually culture C. bovis, or its Cynorhabditis species. And then I placed these plates into the 37 degree incubator and just sort of hoped and prayed that they would survive and reproduce and give me enough worms. Sorry for the imagery here. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't have been worried because they were incredibly happy on these plates, incredibly happy at 37 degrees C, which in and of itself is incredibly cool. And within a week, I had extended my visa by a week, and I had enough worms to begin extracting DNA. And just using a fairly standard isopropanol-based extraction method, I was able to extract about eight micrograms of C. bovis DNA. And so we could move to sequencing, 
And so we opted for a 26G needle shearing approach. We could get these needles at the nearby pharmacy, um, combined with a slightly modified LSK109 protocol. And so we did two runs in the end. The first one um, I prepared here in blue um, went OK. We got about 4.5 gigs, and the read length distribution is not too bad. The second run was done by Stefan. Uh, more data, but the read length is a lot worse. Now, it's not Stefan's fault. This was because I essentially cooked the DNA in an attempt to get it into solution, because I had so little time. But all told, we ended up with about 11 gigs of Minion data. And by this point, I had generated 15 gigs of MySeq data with the help of Eunice down in Ilry at Nairobi. And so I flew back to Edinburgh. Uh, Stefan base called the data and then sent me the fast queues. And then I could start uh, assembling the genome. So I used WTDBJ or Redbean. I then corrected errors with Medaka, and then used Raycon and Pylon with the Illumina data to correct any remaining errors. And the genome is pretty small. It's only 62 MB. And it's assembled into, 60, uh, sorry, assembled into 35 contigs with an N50 of 7.6 MB. And the really exciting thing for me is that these worms have six chromosomes. And here we have half the assembly assembled into just four contigs. And indeed, if you take these large contigs and compare it to the C. elegans genome, and here each line simply represents an orthologous gene pair between these species, you find that for two C. bovis chromosomes, we have, for two of the contigs, they represent completely assembled chromosomes. So really not bad an assembly from data that we generated in rural Kenya. So with this genome, we can now start to ask some of the questions that we had when we first started this project. And one of those is, how does C. bovis relate to C. elegans and all the other species? And so without going into the details of this tree, what we find is that C. bovis is relatively early diverging in the genus. It sits down here, um, meaning it's relatively distant related to C. elegans within this, within this genus. And it's sister to a species called C. placata, which immediately struck me as interesting, because C. placata is the only other species you see on this tree that wasn't isolated from rotting fruit or veg. Instead, it's been isolated once from a dead elephant in Kenya, and once from a dead pine marten in Germany. And it has an association with um, beetles that visit decaying animal carcasses. And this leads us to hypothesize that there may well be a largely undiscovered clade of vertebrate-associated Cynoroditis species. And so potentially lots more to sample and lots more to find here. And something else that we realized straight away when we began working this, with this data is that the genome of C. bovis is essentially homozygous. There's almost no heterozygosity. And this is extremely surprising because Cynoroditis species are known to have some of the highest levels of nucleotide diversity of any known eukaryote. And that usually makes assembly pretty tricky. Heterozygosity is sort of through the roof. And so the fact that the C. bovis genome is so homozygous suggests that a very small number of worms are being transported from ear to ear, and that gene flow between distinct deems is pretty rare, leading to this incredibly inbred genome. Other things we found, we also found expansions in a few gene families that are potentially interesting. And so one of these is PGP11. This is a gene that encodes an ABC transporter in C. elegans, and it's associated with resistance to ivermectin, which is a widely used anti-helminthic drug. And so it's possible that this expansion in C. bovis relates to an ability for C. bovis to more ably withstand drugs that are being used against the cow. Um, Two other gene families that were interesting were these fatty acid and retinal binding proteins and these serine protease inhibitors. Both of these gene families have been independently studied in other nematode parasites because they're believed to play a role in modulating the mammalian host immune response. So again, it's possible that these expansions represent um, some C. bovis doing something active against the cow's immune response. OK, so what's next for C. bovis? Well, the genome is obviously a massive step forward in how much we understand about the species. But we're limited by what we can say just from a genome alone. And so it's still our aim to get these cultures out of Kenya, into the UK, and ultimately to the Cynoroditis Genetic Center, um, where any researcher worldwide could order a strain of these worms and work on them in the lab. That being said, we still know very little about C. bovis in situ. We don't really know what it's doing in the cow's ear or how it's getting from A to B. And so further work is required in Africa and therefore in collaboration with local institutes and scientists before we can fully understand the biology of this interesting little worm. Okay, so all that's left to do is, of course, thank the amazing team that was involved in this collaboration. Thank you to the sampling team who were just so willing to put their fingers in cow's ears to find a worm that they'd never heard of. 
Thank you to Stefan and Eunice for their help with sequencing. Stefan did all the legwork in terms of getting the Minion set up in, in Kenya. And thank you to our supervisors, Professor Eric Fev and Professor Mark Blackster for being so supportive. And of course, thank you to our funding bodies.